And today we'll finally find out how footage like this was captured. Welcome to Inside the Hive.tv, the show that takes you into the world of bees. If you like bees or want to know more about them, please consider subscribing and also hit the bell button so you don't miss a single video. Today, I have the honor and the pleasure to have a guest that I want to bring to the show for a while. He's responsible for this incredible footage that is all over the internet. Dr. Paul Silford, he's here with me. I'm going to bring him in so we can start this conversation. I'm very excited about Hello, Dr. Silford. How are you? Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm very well. Thank you. I, I'm so pumped. My phone started to buzz all over the place with people asking me, can you bring Dr. Silford? Can you bring Dr. Silford? He said, well, I can try. I don't know him, but I can try. And I want to just say thank you here in front of everybody for your, for, for your time and, you know, and your work. Uh, dedicated to, to the bees and to give you, us more information about our favorite insect. So the way I want to try this, um, I, I know we have a little presentation, but I want to give an overview about, if, if you don't know Dr. Paul Silver, uh, he just published a, a, a publication a couple months ago, ago uh, showing a new way to capture footage from inside the hive that brought us new information about the honeybee behavior, things that we never saw before. And that got really got my attention, you know, because I really like things from inside the hive, you know? Yeah, you got it. So that's, that's why I think I'm very excited about this conversation because this new technology can not only sh show us new behavior, but can quantify things and it's, it's very good for science and to show different things and and that's what we're going to talk about here today paul how how did you do that tell us <laughs> oh well that's a long story um it all started in what was it 2013 actually i was uh like to, to go a couple years back i i didn't know what to do in 2012 ish or 2011 because i was like very interested in mo molecular stuff but on the other hand, I was sick of just going uh, uh, into these very sterile environments and, and doing all these uh, things. Um, so I wanted to do uh, something that is more, uh, well, yeah, realistic. No, I don't, I'm not sure what, what's the right word for that, but um, yeah, to, to work with something, with your hands to, to observe something. Um, and so I um, actually, I, I went to a, a short, trip to New Zealand because I wasn't sure what to do with my life after my diploma. And uh, then I started to realize, okay, maybe I can do something with bees. And I started to do my application um, for um, a position here. And uh, that was 2013. I started a, a little practical work. And then, well, yeah, um, I started my PhD here, and that was on the topic of uh, the effects of neonicotinoids on the uh, nursing behavior of honeybees. And in, in our first conversation, it was just like, okay, well, we need to, to, to look exactly in the hive because we don't know what these things or, or these uh, pesticides do inside the hive. We know that there are effects here and there, but um, maybe there's some effect on the nursing behavior. and. And we, we need to figure out some solutions, how we can observe this behavior. Very nice. Uh, I, I like the topic. I know how hard it is to get uh, uh, data, real data, especially with pesticides in a colony level. And so that's why I enjoy this conversation because we can move forward the field and try to uh, you know get better understanding what kind of damage pesticides are doing. Sometimes it's so small, but in a, in a global situation can become so big. Uh, yeah. Can you can you show us how how you did that a little bit of this? Sure, yeah. Setup, um, or... I think I'm 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 online with my presentation uh, uh, here. 
Okay, so let's put your presentation. How I put this? Here we go. Here we go. Cool. You can even see my cursor. Um, so yeah, well, that's that's our institute institute for now. So we're actually having plans to move. Uh, I'm I'm part of this process of viewing a lot of um, data of where the the laboratory goes and and all these little data. How many? Uh, plugs you need in which room, which is a, it's a kind of very, it's a, it's a very um, enlightening uh, uh, experience. Uh, I don't plan a house, but I plan a whole institute. Uh, it's, it's fun, actually. So um, this is our old institute and um, uh, where I'm right now, actually, I'm here. You can see me over here. I could wave, <laughs> uh, open the window and, and say hello. No, that's not a live stream, of course. Um, so we are part of the University of Frankfurt and we are part of the Politechnische Gesellschaft in, in Frankfurt am Main, which was founded 1816. And uh, it has uh, several, um, uh, well, yeah, several sub subgroups. Uh, how do you say that? Tochterunternehmen. I don't know the, the English word. Um, so we are one of these um, Tochterunternehmen. Um, and well, yeah. To continue with this presentation, <clears throat> as I said, I had a, I had a background in uh, starting 2014, so I, I wanted to know exactly um, what the neonicotinoids do because larvae appear to have a relatively high neonicotinoid tolerance, um, but we didn't know what to, what's the problem inside the hive. So the goals of the study were to record the worker on the genesis under the influence of neonicotinoids and determine the effects of nursing parameters, as I said before. And we actually pub published uh, just a couple of uh, years ago, actually, already. So that was like one and a half years ago. Um, we, we published a, a review where we, where we well, summarize all these background effects on neonicotinoids on brood development. And you can also look that up if you want to. So my original idea was to, to take one of these observation hives that we have uh, around here and then just uh, put a camera on, on the breeding area and uh, well have it all covered with a wooden box so uh, well yeah there's no light uh, and you can maintain the temperature and whatsoever so I tried that uh, and I realized that it's really hard to see inside the cells of course um, you see only the abdomen if a bee enters the cell and uh, well it's really hard to see in the cell anyway so with that in mind, I started to uh, look for alternatives, and this was one of the alternatives, uh, which is actually a serving bowl, uh, which is quite um, funny. Um, and this serval, uh, serving bowl um, is part of my experiments uh, because it's a um, well a part of this dome lighting, uh, which is uh, over here. So this would be the serving bowl, and you have a, a light source, a ring ring form light source, and that reflects into the serving bowl. And then you have the object under inspection with very little shadow, or actually no shadow, because the light comes from every uh, every side. And you also reduce reflections to a minimum. Uh, and because it it wasn't available in in the well in the dimensions and in the right wavelength, uh, which I wanted to. Um, so I had to build it myself with a very cheap um, serving bowl, as I said. Wow. So I used some, well, yeah, uh, uh, skills that I acquired during the years in, in some metal craftsmen and, and wooden things. And I built this box and I tried to use one of these observation hives and put a camera in front of it. But um, I tried it with different lighting. So I, I tried it with white, I tried it with some red lighting and also some infrared lighting and uh, uh yeah constructed some some things here and there um to do these the switches and constructed a prototype as you can see here um but as you see one of the problems was for example with these lights that it was too much a spot orientated light so it didn't um and the the angle of of, of uh, light em emission wasn't good enough so um on my glass window i had a lot of reflections and oh. Terrible. I was like, oh no, this is not going to work. This is all so bad. So this is what, what science is. You have a project in mind and you say, well, okay, I can do it like this. And you try to, and it just doesn't work. 
So I tried it with infrared light. It's a little bit better, but it's still very um, much reflection. And as you can see, the contrast is much worse. So uh, switching from infrared light, you can see more structures in the in the red light. That's why I wanted to do more with red light and not with the infrared light. Um, but yes, there is a solution to everything. And one of the solutions was, for example, uh, looking into museums and uh, to see, well, there's a lot of light and there's a glass. Uh, so there's something like anti-reflective glass. Um, and this is, for example, seen over here. So you use regular floating glass on the left side, and then you have these anti-reflective glass on the middle and the right side. So you contact these um, guys and you say, well, I need this and this, and I need it in, in that dimension. And can you do that? Because we are not like a really vast building. We just need a small piece. Um, and they send you some testing materials. And as you can see, it really helps a lot to reduce the reflection. Oh, yeah. Um, this is this is red light over here. It doesn't um, reduce it to an undetectable minimum, but it's um, it's still good. And so I needed, uh, so I, I constructed these uh, ring lightings, as I said it before, and then used these serving balls to reflect these lights. Use the wa wavelength that I that I um, figured out. Honeybees cannot see, so they have their receptor peak over here, the, the third, the, the green. Um, green yellowish one here and so everything that's past this wavelength should be invisible for bees because you don't, you don't want to disturb them of course uh, over the over the long time period that um, well yeah you, you record and so I also did some tests of, of cleaning the glass uh, is the is the glass like broken after I clean it with ethanol or, or can I get this wax and whatever um, actually just removed completely or how much time does it take because I want to reuse that I don't want to buy it again and again um, that would be too costly and then I did some in initial tests with with this big observation hive that you, you've just seen and as you can see you can still see these dome over here yeah um, and I had I had one I had one frame up here just a, a regular well where it's a honey honeycomb frame, a food super, as you wish, uh, as you can say. And um, then down here, I had these uh, glass stripes uh, with these uh, cones that I turned 90 degrees. Um, but what I figured out with this setup was it was actually not that good of a re re resolution. So you have a lot of things you can see and you can, uh, you can follow a wide area, but the resolution is kind of bad. And also, it's um, like this is this would be one of the resolutions uh, here up here in the food super, and you can see waggle dances. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't like it um, because it was um, the, the reflections were still too much, and it was too much going on. Um, so I started to reduce it, the um, well the area that I wanted to observe, and so I started to build my own observation hives. Um, which is the same envir environment that you've just see seen for the uh, lighting stuff mm -hmm. uh, for the first uh, episode, I would say. And, um, well, yeah, I, I used this setup, which is a mini plus um, frame. It's, uh, it's much smaller. It's like, I don't know, maybe 20 centimeters. I'm not sure you don't use centimeters, do you? I, I cannot, I cannot. I do, I, I do, but uh, in America, they don't use the metric system, but... Uh... I won't be able to translate me, that. Me, me too. <laughs> OK. So anyhow, so um, this this setup just had like half of the stripes down here in the in the breeding area and had, a, of course, like the other setup, had a um, queen grid. So the queen was only allowed to go into the, the lower half of these um, of these hives or observation hives. Um, and yeah, I built a couple of, of these, of course, um, to, to do multiple experiments in parallel. And as I said earlier, I, I, I used fully constructed cones and just cut them um, into, well, yeah, very tightly defined uh, width and then turned them 90 degrees and put them into these glass stripes. Um, and so yeah. You cut yourself. You you. you Yes, I, you actually need to 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 do a what is it called um, uh, a template, kind of a template. So you really have like 
a fixed amount of, 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 of width. So they press um, exactly into these uh, frames. Otherwise, they will waggle and they will fall. And, and at some day, you, you may actually be able to see that they waggle a little bit, like these um, cooms. They they move because the bee, bees start to move them. Mm -hmm. and that's how they also know. Well, we we desperately need to fix them to the glass, and that's what they do in this video. So, wow. as you can see here, I I did some tests with the uh, with the various lightings. So how how much light uh, does the objective uh, capture how much um well um, contrast do you do do i need um how much gain and and all these little settings so as you can see at first it looks like 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 this so it's more grayish and then uh you start to to experiment a little bit and then you get a better contrast like that for example and then I also uh, realized I don't need, I don't need like 20 frames per second, which is only killing your hard disk drives in a in a in a period of days. But yeah, that would be my question now about data management is so much probably so much memory that. Yeah, that's the software side of of, of this whole problem. So you need, um, I mean, data is quite cheap. I would say you can you can buy a lot of hard disk space, but still um, video um, information and, and I'm, I'm quite lucky to have monochrome video information because the, the color information would be even even worse in um, terms of uh, data consumption or data usage and in that case um, uh, I, I, I needed a very good graphic cards to do real-time um, compression um, so this is all JPEG compressed it's 75 percent JPEG compression um, so you, yeah, I need to, I need to figure out that because otherwise I, I just started the, the, the recordings and my one terabyte, uh, was just full in, in an hour or, or whatever. So wow. there needed to be some, some real time compression if you want to do high resolution, um, observations. And then I reduced the frame rate. So low, um, temporal resolution. Um, which was sufficient for my observations um, for the, the long-term video observations for, I don't know, um, I think it was uh, three weeks, uh, about three weeks, uh, continuous recordings. Three weeks. Four cameras, wow. yeah. Well, th that, was one, that was one run, so that was one experiment. So if you see the data, you see May 2016, then it's uh, three weeks of continuous recordings of around 420 cells that you can see here. So you can, after a while, these um, the brood will develop within these cells, and yeah. So you can you can exactly see how often a nursing bee visits, and uh, well, how how long the feeding is and how long in inspections are or how often they will heat or, or clean or whatever the behaviors are inside the cells. So yeah, this is pretty much the setup. Actually, hang on, there should be some more images over here. So as you can see, the camera uh, was in front of these illumination um, dome lightings and then there was this observation hive the camera was filming the breeding area, which is over here, and um, it was all filmed, uh, filled these observation hives with 300 grams of bees, which is around 3,000 bees, and that was all placed in a dark and tempered room, and they had outside access to forage pollen, for example, but they had a feeder on top, uh, which and in which I applied the neonicotinoids, for example, in the um, in these experiments. In other experiments, I would just um, well, yeah, just put some some sugar solution in in the beginning, and then they would just uh, develop. Uh, for example, for these macro recordings that you you showed in the introduction, and then I had four of these. Uh, right now, they are all en encapsulated, I would say, on these uh, on these wooden um, tables. It was actually quite um, hard or challenging to to find a, a suitable spot. Um, where you all have like it needs to be kind of a long spot to 
uh, ensure that there's the similar uh, conditions. So if you would place one on, on that side and it would go forage to the south, then they might be more effective than if, if the entrance uh, or the exit was uh, facing north. So that's why we needed a, a, a quite of a long uh, room. And yeah, right now I, I'm able to film seven of these simultaneously with this recording PC over here. And this is a kind of an old um, image. Uh, it's how, many? how many can you do simultaneously? Well, right now I have um, seven um, cameras. Um, actually, we have many more, but um, we only our recording software um, on the level that we purchased it has only the cap capability to um, record seven um, seven uh, camera streams simultaneously. Wow! So that's why we can do seven of these. Well, after the initial one or two years, I upgraded and I did more. And as you know, I just upgrade after upgrade. So yeah, these are images, um, example images of these um, hives. Um, and as you can imagine, it's quite hard to follow uh, every single cell. And uh, you'd need, I don't know how many uh, centuries to um, to just watch the video material of each individual's uh, cell. So you need some sort of automatic classification um, or at least a semi-automatic classification so you know when there is an event in the cell and then you can um, choose as a human, well, that was an event that interests me, for example, the feeding behavior, or uh, was it something that is just um, not important at all? Um, and that's why we, I developed with, a, with some colleagues of, um, of our um, university in the mathematical um, work group uh, from Professor Ramesh. Um, we developed um, a neural network. Actually, I, first of all, I, I developed uh, here um, like a well, like uh, possibilities to to see um, the events happening within these uh, hours of observations or days of observations, weeks of observations. So we, what you can see here um, is an, a space-time image, which was the idea of uh, Professor uh, Ramesh. Um, to this is this is a projection of a of a two D image like mm -hmm. this one over here. Uh, into uh, actually it's a, a, a 3d image because it's uh, two dimensions plus time so time would be the third dimension so it was a sort and, of histogram with the time component in it yeah so we re, we reduce the, the the two dimensions to one dimension we just draw a line in this in in this cell over here so what you can see here the green line from here to here would be the line from here to here Oh, I see. So everything bright up here would be the lava. Um, and each time a worker, which is a little bit darker than the, the background, would enter the cell, we would get a peak. So you can actually play this, for example. And you can see wow. when, we, when we have a peak, we can see what the, what the bee is doing over here. So that's how I... Um, that's how I um well yeah verified that the the events that were detected from a certain threshold were actually feedings so one of that would be well a feeding must be very close to the lava so i need i need a, a possibility to detect the lava which is which is the red line over here so you, you see it's it's not it's not very like necessary to to do it exactly over uh, like in uh, that line, but um, but if it if it's just uh, down here or if it's very short, for example, then it it's probably not a feeding. Um, so you need it very deep in, in the cell, very close to the lava, and you need it uh, for a certain period of time, which is, for example, more than ten seconds in in that case. Um, and it needs to be, as I said, but but this varies, for example. So if the lava grows, then then this space, uh, which is taken up here, uh, will get smaller. So 
um, it was quite challenging to program that um, to be able to detect the events that would be um, interesting for me. And then I can manually classify um, these events. So and what I realized is, did you have any question? That's fascinating. You know, so you, uh, let me see if I got it. And so you create those images and the image, you know, 20 image per second or something like that. And oh, then you create one, this. One, one, one frame per second, is it? One frame per second. Yep. And then you have this digital marker that you identify yourself. And then you teach the computer to identify those digital markers and start to quantify them. Yeah, it's kind it's, of. <laughs> uh, we did these space-time images, as I as I said. Like you you can see down here, you can see um, a filter um, of these these black events are actually filtered by a, a certain um, a certain threshold, um, gray threshold. So we know the the B has a, a certain um, what do you what do you say um, darkness. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can filter out these events and then you can jump from event to event and you can see over here, this is 16 hours as you see down here. So this line, all these little dots over here. So we are right now, we are somewhere here um, and this is 16 hours. And so we have uh, heaps of these parts um, just stuck to each other. So in, in parallel, actually in, in serial. Um, so what I wanted to say is that I, I realized um, I actually didn't um, have to look um, on the video data. I was able to figure out that this is a feeding with very high probability because it has this um, structure over here. And then we have a structure which is very unique because the, the bee does not move while she's feeding, for example. So we have some antenna movements. This is the, the, the small um, wow. area over here but we don't have a movement of the body of the worker. And this is the inspection phase where it will see, um, the worker will check the, the status of the lava and if it's hungry and whatsoever. Uh, it can be a very short inspection phase uh, over here, for example, but you have some characteristics. Also, the worker moves into the cell a little bit deeper and, and this is like a, I don't know, a linear curve over here and, and if you're human, you just need to see like 10 or 20 of these events and you can see, well, this is definitely feeding, but this is not. And I was like, okay, this can, a computer can do the same thing. Well, you have Facebook algorithms or whatever, you, you can detect um, objects with neural networks. Um, so I started to extra, um, extract all these events, which you can see in these red borders and I just fed it to a neural network or trained neural networks to discriminate between these um, different behaviors. And I was able to um, get a very high probability of discriminating between feeding and others or between feeding, heating, um, building activity or something else, which was also like um, approximately 96% correct. Um, so you just click one click, and in that case, um, well, yeah, you, you just have like this color coding. Okay, this is a heating event. Uh, this is something else. Wow. And all these green things you can see here are feeding events. So, yeah, you just, you just run through all these events. You say, well, that's the start, that's the end, and then use the, use the image of this space-time image. You don't use the video data, actually. You just use the space-time image here. And uh, you can classify that in a, in a neural network. So this is, this is what uh, we've done so far. Um, we want to go a step further now and, and analyze the whole video uh, and the behavior from, from video data. And we'll, we'll see if, it's, if it gets better uh, compared to this method. Um, yeah. And also, like right now, we are also doing um, uh, better color um, videos, just color. for Ooh. entertainment purposes, I would say. There's no real scientific question behind that, but that's a setup right now. Yeah, and we published uh, all of that um, in two publications, which is um, uh, published in scientific reports. 
Um, this is the, all the stuff about the method, the aperture that I just showed or shared, and how we did the analysis, and then the, the results um, regarding the neonicotinoid treatments. Um, for example, number of feeding visits, duration of feeding visits, and the development time. And just recently, we published the, the more like, well, which, which was caught up more by the public. Um, that was all the behaviors with, uh, within the colony. And um, behaviors such as building, feeding, cooling, you just, you just um, seen it in the, in the introdu intro introduction. And what, yeah. what, what was new that come from that? Some uh, behaviors that were not described before or something that was completely new? Well, most of them, I would say to, to, um, to, be, to be honest, most of them was already described in, in text or, or line drawings sometimes. Um, but it's something very different to see it uh, with your own eyes and uh, to follow it even, uh, I mean, especially in, a, in an environment where, where videos um, have a lot of, um, well, broad audience such as from streaming platforms like YouTube or, or something else. And um, that's why this can be used for educational purposes much better. But there was also things that I hadn't anticipated seeing. For example, um, um, I also say the, 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 the rare mouth-to-mouth -mouth feeding, for example, um, that we observed usually workers just feed anywhere in the, in the um, cell or near close to the lava. But in, in certain cases, um, this, is, this is right next to the mouth of the lava and then it's a short moment uh, where the lava will eat from the directly from the from the worker uh, but also other things like the well the varroa stuff was new to me it was also described uh, before um, but there was more um, like the the wax moth for example um, has a very interesting tactic of um, using its silk to um, fixate the emerging worker from the from hatching um, and that makes it um, undetectable within the cell while it still feeds from the from the remains and leftovers um, of the pupation period um, from the worker and that was interesting for example um, I'll definitely have some some more things um, that will come up. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I think all of us are going to be waiting for those. Yeah, but I, the way I see also is uh, because the way those uh, behaviors were described before was with different techniques, and this one was more accurate. I would say with the with the red light, and and you can kind of confirm what was described before also, not only see the new things, but also confirm things that was trying to get in different conditions and more artificial conditions that have different lights that could potentially change the behavior they were, describe, they were describing before. Is that pretty, well, pretty nice? That is, that is a good point because um, I started to realize that people sometimes have a, have a very um, weird feeling, uh, no, uh, weird feeling, have a, a weird perception of what is actually happening uh, within the hive. Uh, for example, um, um, on, on, on this figure, you can see um, how the lava sh should develop, like just going up in the cell, which is of course completely wrong. Yeah. And um, then you also see like here, you can see the, the wings are extended already. This is also wrong. And you see heaps of these um, illustrations so these these line drawings or these illustrations are are wrong in in several ways. Uh, if you if you see the developmental videos um, that I published, then you can see the difference. For example, so there's of course um, we have the, this this period it doesn't stretch in the, in the, in the cell uh, until it gets capped and then it starts to do the pupation. Uh, actually, the the spinning the cocoon spinning, which is not shown here, it just lies here as a pre pupa, which is which is wrong as well. So you need to do some movement in, in, in the 
on the ninth day, for example, but on the eleventh day it will it will start to to lie there as a, as a pre-pupa. But then, as you can see, the the um, on day seventeen here we don't we don't have uh, developed um, wings. It's just a very small wing over here. So this is this is one of the examples where we we had to to correct some misconceptions. Um, that was a, a advantage uh, of this method, surely. Yeah, pretty nice. It's a lot of work, and uh, there are people at home are thanking you for all the effort and that you put in to bring us this new information. Yet people are, people are excited. So you you have seen that oh, actually we were we were talking about a few of these uh, things. You want to yeah. see the yeah, mouth, yeah, yeah. mouth feeding, for example. It is amazing. So yeah, you have this um, period of this inspection period. Um, what I've just uh, shown in on on the other um, on the space time image, uh, which is a lot of head movements uh, and antenna movements. And you can see that um, a feeding is imminent when these uh, mandibles start to clatter or mm -hmm. start to move. I don't know, is, cl is clatter a, a, an English word? Yeah. Well, you, you asked the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Just I would stop. say yes. Anyway. If anybody at home know, can <laughs> have the answer, please let us know. Yeah, so... Um, so in, in, in that case, usually they 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 can feed here or wherever in in the cell close to the lava, because it's like, um, yeah, the food the jelly is is somewhat um, around the lava anyway. And it seems the the larvae not even realize something is going on until until, until something, something happens. Yeah. They have some chemical re receptors, so they need to to of course, they need to find food. Yeah. Um, and Look at, at that. that point, it just Maybe realizes, it okay, there's something going on. I'll accept that treat. Yeah, exactly. No, so there's this small, too. small period where it just you, you can actually see it like taking up the fluid, which you can see even clearer when when the worker leaves it just like these are feeding machines they just they are just there to 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 consume things consume yeah, yeah. Is, is and it wants more it wants oh, more. Yeah, yeah. there's yeah, no more. nothing more so it has to go to the other point and that's why they turn in the, in the cell they they want to reach the the freshly provided food they always they always want more yeah yes no, it's, it's very nice yeah it's that beautiful. was one it was one thing that we uh, just mentioned. I think I didn't publish this video, for example, what I was just um, mentioning before. So this is like a horror show. Um, this is uh, this worker couldn't emerge because this wax moth lava um, oh, man. was um, fixating it um, with its silk over here. And it's just um, only the head was able to, to go out Oh, that work was only well yeah and we we got a, a couple weeks ago uh, a similar situation they apparently they got stuck in the bottom and you you can see the 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 silk there and they apparently die with the tones out with the proboscid out well, and, in, in that case this worker got lucky so this this worker was only delayed for two or three days and was fed by other workers so it actually survived and this um lava was was safe in that period and as you can see it starts to eat uh remains of the pupation process i would say wow. uh, but yes as i it wasn't it wasn't an, an, on purpose that i wanted to film uh, wax moth lava but um, I was like, okay, if, if that all neo nicotine eat stuff just fails, I will I will just continue and and do a whole PhD thesis about the behavior on wax moth lava. That would be my question. If you put that on purpose, it was a but it wasn't. No, as you can as you can see in the um, I mean they are very good environment uh, environmental con uh, con conditions for wax moth in in, in, um, in the conditions that I've um, used yeah. in the setups. And as you can see, 
I usually use these stripes, um, so glass stripes, um, and and as you can see, there's always a, a little gap between, and some of these gaps were were bigger than others. Um, so the wax moth would just sit here, would lay some eggs over here, and then the very very young larva would just would just crawl through this small gap. And um, well, yeah, after a while you would have wax moth lava everywhere. So we started to treat it with, um, I don't know, it's, it's called B401. Um, it's a toxin, endotoxin. So if the larva takes it up, it will somehow die. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty um, unharmful, or it's actually completely unharmful for honeybees and it's biological. I'm not sure what it is um exactly but it, it works and it's it's not harmful and it's no big chemical stuff wow thanks for sharing thanks for sharing that's fascinating things you probably have a lot of weird stuff that happens <laughs> that you don't know what's going on yeah well you you figure it you figure it out wh what's happening but of course um you you don't um, expect the things, um, and all of a sudden there's just this event, and you're like, oh my god, what was that? Yeah, that's the beauty of science. You always what what's going on here? And then there's a different new project coming from nowhere, from a simple new observation that you were not expecting at all. Yep. Cool. So also the cocooning, I was very oh, fascinated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you you were able to to. Um, this process was described. It, of course, it was described, but there's just nothing than than, than comparing to 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 see this process. Actually, most of the the audience that I've shown what what the development is like, they were so surprised that the lava moves inside the cell after it it got capped. Uh, the cell gets capped. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, there's these small tapping movements with the anterior end, so that's the head of the lava. And that's where the silk glands are located. And uh, that's how they spin the cocoon. And yeah, they do that for quite some time. That's actually 36 hours, so it's one and a half days cocooning process. Wow. Yeah. Look. So one one day and a half. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Okay. And in, in, in the black and white videos, you, you only see you don't really see the, the silk. You can only see it's it's more like a glass. Um I don't know, I'm not sure how to say that. It's um the glass doesn't get as it's it's quite transparent, but it looks more like a, a, a glass window of your toilet, you know, like um, yep. where you cannot see through um, very well, diffracted somehow. And but um, on the other hand, I was uh, I just recently filmed some um, some color. Um, footage and there you can see it uh, much better um, so you're, you're investing some time now to go to color technology uh, yeah much, much more data yeah i haven't i haven't published that but um this is just uh, uh um one of the as you can see here for example that's the silk here that's all these cocooning stuff and right now there's a bee uh, probably hatching in a couple of hours this was from May 4th, so just a couple of days ago. What was it, like two weeks ago? And I, I'll just quickly show you how this process looks like. Wow, look at that. But and since this is not like, I'm, I'm, I might uh, use that in, in a future uh, publication or, or something else. So yeah, I'll be, leave it with that. OK. <laughs> Well, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. Very, very nice. And I'm sure a lot of different things can be done with that. You know, what what questions now you are interested to answer using that technology? Um, so we um, 
we'd be able to um, to use various uh, chemicals, for example, used in uh, apiculture. Um, or, um, for example, just other um, crop protecting pro products um, to, to see what the effects on the behavior inside the hive would uh, are really. But on the other hand, I also like to answer some uh, general um, some general questions or like without much modification, as you can see, just like filming behavior within the colony is also very re rewarding. It's not like a, an, an enormous scientific question, but it's um, it's very useful for the public. Um, to enhance ecological awareness, for example, or to bring these all these um, videos and movies into classrooms and homes, facilitating the the well, you would you'd say I don't know maybe children will will start to talk yeah. about it and they will see bees in a different um, in a different spotlight or in, on a different view and then um, they might be interested in, in in protection or like the bee is of course um, a symbol of um, ecological awareness, I would say. And um, this would be, uh, that's why I want to um, also show just what's going on inside the cell um, just during the, the whole developmental pro process. So I was fixated or, on the nursing behavior. Like I know exactly how often uh, the nurses fed this uh, the, these larvae, but um, I would also like to to show that we are able to to analyze exactly um, how often was their building behavior or or um, heating behavior, so thermoregulation behavior or uh, cleaning behavior or um, other things. Um, so all the various behaviors, it would, be, it would be a very basic fundamental question, um, but it would also help uh, sci scientists to um, evaluate um, when they use their experiments. Uh, is that very possible or is it, could it be that this, what I interpret as feeding event, may be more related to a, a different event? If, you're not, if you don't have the possibility to look sideways into the cell, for example, yeah. uh, you want to, to, to look from, from the top, and then you see a bee entering and then, okay, so what is this bee doing? Is there a high chance or a high possibility that this would be a feeding event? Um, and I would, I would list all, all that uh, in a, well, yeah, in a, in a publication, for example. But then, as I said, um, more, more possibilities. We, we try to, to manipulate um, um, individual cells. So we moved these, um, these stripes uh, just one uh, a little bit out, and then we inserted a glass pipette, and then uh, we were able to to modify, for example, or just insert some some blockers for certain uh, circuits or like the cholinergic system, for example. And um, we were successful in, in applying the method, but on the other hand, the the workers would just detect what we we've just done, and they would just reverse it. They would just clean it up. So we're having trouble um, finding consistent um, data that is um, really interesting for the sci uh, um, science community um, in manipulating individual cells um, and then have a look how the workers behave um, or how the, the, the lava will develop. Um, but yeah, there will be, for example, Varroa inserting, um, I, I also... <laughs> I did like a, a, a small suction, like Varroa inserting in, in the cell was 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 done by a vacuum pump mm -hmm. just with a long pipette or long capillary. I just um, well sucked on the the Varroa and then maybe I have a maybe I have a video of that here, but it probably won't. No, it, it, quite a quite a funny um, appearance. Uh, let me see if I have something here. Maybe maybe it's on the... No, it's not on there. No, no. I won't have it. Yeah, yeah. it's so many questions can be answered now. Much more precise, I would say. Yeah, I'm very curious about the next chapters that are coming. I'm sure a lot of 
different new publications that will be coming from you. And uh, I'm very curious to see what's coming up. Or Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's. So you, I, I remember you have a paper that were already using this technology that you were able to detect some differences with neonicotinoids. There is how how it was quantified. You know, this is something that people were asking me. How how would you quantify and what's what's the damage that those uh, neonics were doing to the bees? Um, what do you mean with with quantified? So, because you quantified the number of events, and that was your per parameter to, to to say the pesticides were having some in the, uh, low, for example, low feeding events or low um, maintenance events. So that was your quantification, your metric to to quantify from the group without pesticides and the bees with pesticide. How do you measure those differences using your technology? I think that's the question. So maybe I can share this uh, screen over here, where you can see that's one of the images on the of the scientific reports uh, publication. Actually, you see that the bottom here is uh, you you cannot see which is which. Um, so this is actually control um, on the left one. You always have the control on the left column, mm -hmm. and then you have the various. Um, why is this displayed like that? Maybe I need to, well, anyway. Um, so we have clothianidine over here and, and theocloprid. For example, what, what we were, um, what's possible doing is we just count how often the feeding events occurred on, on the larval development day one, for example. So this is day one, day two, day three, four, five, and six. And um, so, as you can as you can see here, we have well yeah an, an increase in feeding visits with each day. When you go at the mean, which is over here, sorry, this is this is really bad yeah, in, in following um, because th this is the mean. So on the right we have the mean, and this is May two thousand and sixteen, May two thousand eighteen, June two thousand sixteen, and July two thousand sixteen. So, um, and this is the mean of all these um, um, graphs here. And you can see uh, that there are 4.4 feedings in the, in the, in the, on the first level development day, and then we have 7.1, which is of course just a, a mean, well, that's a number, you, you cannot have 0.1, uh, it's either four or seven, but um, well, that's a statistical number. Yep. And then you have 11 and 25, uh, um, 23 on the fourth day and then on the fifth day there's there's the most for example most uh, feeding events and then we have the seventh uh, sorry the sixth day uh, which is uh, well very much reduced because somewhere during the sixth day usually the cell is capped and then it just it, it stops of course no feedings are counted anymore yeah. so we have around when you go to the left here we have around a hundred and 15 or uh, 110, 215 uh, uh, feeding visits during um, during the development in in these hives. Um, yes, and then what what you can see is that the other the the, the, the treatments were actually lagging behind. So if you have theocloprid 200 parts per billion, so that's a concentration. Um, which is actually found in, 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 in several pollen uh, samples uh, here in Germany, then you, you see, well, what was 4.4 before was like 3.3 .3, uh, only. And then we have uh, 7.1 on the second day, actually, but then we only have 4.4 uh, in, in this treatment. And as you can compare, you, you see it's always lower. So the cumulative effect is also getting worse. So so. So uh, until the fourth day, for example, we have a total of, oh, let me see, uh, 45 to 50, or 45 probably. Yeah. And on, on, on in this treatment, we only have like uh, 35 or, or 30. Um, so it's a difference of, of around 10, five to 10 feedings uh, um, 
until the same um, time point. And this continues until the fifth day where you can see uh, there's the, this very big difference between these um, uh, treatments. And then interestingly, um, they catch up um, on the sixth level development day, uh, which is which is an indication that the, the nurses actually perceive the status of the larva correctly because they know, okay, it's still hungry, it still needs to develop, it still needs more time, and they adjust their behavior and they, they just feed longer. So the development time is longer, so they need to, to feed more on the um, sixth develop, development day. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, so what, uh, yeah. do you do the there was any damage to the larvae or just a, a different timing of development? There was a, but at the end of the day, it was enough to have damage or were just a, it slowed down, but then they catch up later or something. Exactly. Like so, so what we've seen in, in, well, field realistic concentrations, what we would um, describe as field realistic, which was like one PPB clothianidine, uh, we haven't seen that much in, in one PPB clothianidine, but um, quite some effects with a 10 PPB clothianidine. We had some publications that describe that as field realistic, which is quite a, high, uh, a bit higher than, than what, we, what we would expect. So one PPB you can, you can find quite often um, in samples. Um, but bear in mind, this is, this is only from like bee bread or, or, or honey or, or other um, <clears throat> uh, well, bee products. Um, and it, the, the, the acute dose, this is, this is the chronic dose, I would say, but the acute dose could be much higher uh, from a bee, um, just taking up some nectar, which has a, a much higher concentration, and then it will spread into the, uh, in the uh, colony. And what we've seen is um, there's no um, higher amount of, of, of dying, for example. It, it, it would just uh, impair development. So when you look at May 2016, you'd see it, it goes from 5.3 um, uh, days of feeding time span. So that's from the first to the last feeding um, and to, for example, here uh, to 5.7 days, which was a significant increase um, in the feeding time span. So as I said, it just shifts into the sixth development day more or until the sixth development day here is um, is uh, reached or completed, and you you've seen uh, we've seen similar defect uh, effects here in, in in May, and I would say we would get some more effects in in June as well uh, from from this one if we if we would had more um, data points, but uh, clothian and gene here for example we also have a very strong effect, but on the other hand then we have some month for example the July which is very surprising to us, which were like totally different. Um, and that's why we have such a, a high variation that we were not um, able to see any significant effect in the mean. So you need to look closely to the, to the individual um, repetitions um, because sometimes you cannot see um, the, the effects in the, in the mean. We would need much more um, repetitions uh, to really prove that there's a there's a, a continuous effect but these experiments unfortunately take a lot of time so you only have a very small window where you can do these experiments it's in the breeding area which is uh, a breeding period which is only from here around it's from May to maybe at maximum July um, so you can see sometimes in August you can also see brood but it's it's scattered and um, there's not much nectar um, around or, or also pollen. Well, pollen, there, there would be a little bit more pollen. But these experiments went really well um, in, the, in a very um, narrow time frame. So we had to repeat it and as often as we were as possible. And it seems like we, we've less, left out um, 2017, but that was actually, I don't have. I don't have the, I don't have the, the, the image here. 2017, we, we did a high concentration and looked at the, on, at the development time. So this is, is spring in Germany? Uh, what's, this, what season what we're 
the July is different from May, for example. We're talking. What, well, what? yeah, this is this is. I mean, this is of course this is summer. Yeah, um, summer. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure when spring or summer starts. Because uh, I I have similar things. I know the bees behave completely different. They are biochemically different from season to season, and it, it's clear in winter. But uh, I know from injecting pathogens on them, I, I know every season they react different to the same pathogen. So I'm curious to to see this happening, uh, this the, 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 the response for different stimulus in different seasons in the biochemistry of the bee itself. It's very fascinating to see that July so, is summer, right? Yeah, so, so, so this can give a good hint I mean, bear in mind that these are small colonies, so yeah. they are not like uh, exactly comparable, maybe to the to the bigger hives. But um, there is one, uh, there is a possibility that that this will exactly replicate uh, in in these bigger colonies. Um, and this is this is uh, one thing. The other thing I just forgot. I'll oh, forget it. Uh, I'll, wow. I'll um, remember it some time. All right. Oh, we all thank you. So let's see. Let's see if people at home have some questions for you, uh, guys. If you can hear me, and now is the time. If you have questions, please uh, write in the chat room so I can read them and ask Paul myself. I know it's a lot to digest. There is a, a lot of different technologies and yeah but i just want to say one more time thank you paul for for your time and dedication for the science for the bees for your educational purpose so because you publish this also and and give license to everybody to use whatever way they want which is very generous from uh of you and i want to thank you in the name of the whole bee community sure my pleasure yeah but it's also um, oh um, more more yeah no no you can you can switch to your you think that it's just interesting to to see that the the development time can actually vary quite dramatically within these hives or in general probably depending on how much brood there is to care for so we we've seen like 5.8 in the beginning like when there's only seven days passed or when the when when the development started seven days after the experiment uh, compared to 14 days of, of the experiment, we had only like a development of, of five or 5.2 days. Um, so um, with time, with progressing time, uh, the bees start to develop more quicker. Um, but as you can see, we also have like under, under five days uh, somewhere here, for example, in, in, in some cases. Mm -hmm. so this doesn't need to be like 5.5 days all the time. You also have like these really big outliers, like wow. 6.7 days of development, for example. So you can see there's a mean, but um, this is not always uh, the case. Uh, yeah, it's, it's varying depending on the conditions, depending on the brood nest, depending on the amount of workers or nurses there are. Um, but it definitely did not depend on the treatment because these slopes look all uh, kind of similar. And there's yeah. no statistical difference between these um, slopes. Anyway, let's get uh, to your questions. I don't know why I had to um, bring that up. I don't see people question, a lot of questions, but I have a question myself. I, one of your videos, I, I never saw that before with the behavior of bringing water inside the cell. And yep. I, 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 I never thought it was that much. Uh, and I never thought that was true. And I always was considering now, every time I, I get a frame of bees and I turn, I, I, was, I was wondering myself if, if I'm drowning the, the larvae with the big drop of water they put inside the cell. <laughs> and I don't know why that's sticking in my head now. Everybody, everybody, every, every time I'm looking at frame of bee, and I turn, I feel like that that drop of water go and drown the, the larvae. <laughs> oh, you I'm have not, it here. I'm not sure how many bees you killed already. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I, 
or uh -huh. everybody because everybody look at the frames the same way they turn and then and i was wondering if we ever have a way to quantify that the the damage that we cause to the bees every time you open the hive well, I would I would say even if that happens, um, the the bee will probably pretty or the, the bees the workers will pretty um, quickly um, detect that there's uh, well diluted food or um, that the the larva will well not be able to to breathe anymore because you covered the stigma with um, with water. But yes. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe I can, I can do. It's it. It probably sticks pretty good. Like like the the adhesion the adhesion forces of the water um, is is probably quite um, quite good. I'm not sure if it will just like move very easily. Maybe it, it won't even. I don't know. Touch the lava. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I, I, that that image is stuck in my head, and every time I. I look at the bees now. I'm thinking about that. You mean uh, so, the, the the cooling process? You mean? Yeah, yeah, that one. It's a lot of water uh, that they put in the cell to to cool. Sometimes, yeah. To cool down, so it's not always that amount. No, um, it's very it's it's very various. I mean, it's it's very dynamic and. Um, Sometimes they just put in very small droplets. Sometimes they put in very large ones. Okay. If that embryo, for example, would be would be like just covered a little bit with water, it probably would survive. I'm not yeah. sure how long it would survive because they definitely need to breathe as well. Um, and water is not a very good um, medium to transfer oxygen. Yeah. But yeah, they will they will cool down the, the the hive by evaporating water yeah when i saw that big bubble there that big drop i was it's, impressed because i never said wow he's a lot i never thought there was so much water in it it seems like yeah it seems like this is a really big one but i also like the the hy hydro um Wow. Um, the water repelling. So yeah, I don't have the English word in my head. The the water repelling. Um, uh, well, yeah. Properties from the water. Properties. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. they they don't get wet at all, as you can see. So it, it was just dripping with water. Or it was just placed in in water the whole head. Yeah. Yeah. Look but it's it. it's it's not wet at all. Yeah. After. The water the water is not touching it. Wow, yeah, beautiful. Hydrophobic. Hi yes, hydrophobic. That's yes, the word. Yeah. that's the word we're looking for. It seems like it's the same worker that that enters the cell just a couple of seconds again. So, so maybe it just decided. Well, Humberto said that was too yeah. big of a, a, a droplet. I will, I will need to I, adjust that. I'm gonna impress him. I'm Otherwise, he will, yeah. He will have no. Uh, he will have nightmares about how many bees he killed. Already. He's killed every day. Open a hive and looking at frames of bees. Exactly. All right. Um, all right, Paul. I just want to say one more time in the name of the bee community. Thank you very much for for sharing this thing with us today. For sharing your work and, and license for free for everybody to look at for educational purposes. Uh, and. and I think uh, all of us, the whole world is going to be beneficial from this, your work. And I uh, just want to say thank you one more time. Thank you for having me, Humberto. And uh, see you soon. See yeah, you around. Uh, see you around in the B meetings. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, cooperate someday. Yeah, we, we need to talk. Some fancy fancy um, things. I have, I have some e draft emails already in place. So you're going to get some pretty soon. <laughs> cool. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show.